Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. We are not going to get political tonight, but we do want to talk about some of the geopolitical events that are happening and how that affects cybersecurity and what defenders should be thinking about. So if you haven't been paying attention to the news, you might not know that Russia has a lot of soldiers lined up on the Ukraine border. If you have been paying attention to the news, you know that we're about into a diplomatic crisis right now with the U.S. and Russia. And pretty much the U.S. government is convinced that President Putin is ready to invade Ukraine, which is a very, very bad thing. If you read some of the news, or maybe you're not aware, the cyber attacks that were state sanctioned by the Russian government have been happening for weeks prior to this. CISA released an alert on January 11th about understanding and mitigating Russian state-sponsored cyber threats to U.S. critical infrastructure. I'll put a link in the show notes, but it's really good to read through this. It's pretty basic stuff about how you should secure your infrastructures, what to look for. They had indicators of compromise on there. um, So you can go through that and take a look. But this has been happening for weeks. And then January 13th and 14th, following a breakdown of diplomatic talks between Russia and Western governments, state-sponsored hackers launched a defacement attack that brought down a dozen Ukraine government websites, including the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Education, and others. And the hackers posted a message that said, be afraid and expect the worst. It's pretty ominous stuff. And then on January 15th, Microsoft revealed the discovery of malware on the Ukraine websites. There's a technical blog that details all the indicators of compromise, how it works, um, how it goes through different stages, And it's a good read if you're interested on uh, different types of malware and how malware acts on systems. So on top of all that, right now the Olympics are happening in Beijing. And the FBI warned U.S. athletes prior to going there and them being there right now that they should all bring burner phones, that they shouldn't have their personal devices because... If they did, it most likely will be compromised and personal information will be spied on. In fact, they said, you know, use a phone that you can break in half before you get on the plane to come back to the U.S. The FBI said that there should be no expectation of privacy, that China has some of the most sophisticated modern surveillance, that it has facial recognitions, video cameras everywhere, web traffic is tightly monitored, And that if you connect to free Wi-Fi or use a personal cell phone, everything that is on that should be considered vulnerable. So these are two big geopolitical issues that are going on right now. Adam, why should we be concerned about this stuff? You know, what inspired the idea to do the show on this subject this week was one of our customers, Andy, that, that we work with bringing some of these ideas to the forefront and asking for ways to mitigate them. And it was a really interesting conversation to have because they were really just looking to kind of go back and forth. Like Andy, I think you said in our pre-show before we went on the air, do essentially kind of a tabletop exercise and talk through some of the challenges and talk through some of the ways we can mitigate them. Because ultimately, if you have an authoritarian or autocratic government that controls all of the communications networks in that country, your expectation of privacy goes way down. 
and the impacts to your business go way up. And that's what was being brought to our attention was, say, for example, a cellular network was compromised and became owned by um, a, a different government than the one that had uh, been the sovereign state in, in that geographic area. Um, and, and what would that look like and, and how would they gain control and what could they gain access to and everything else? And these are good questions to ask. And, you know, we'll kind of parse this out as we, we have our conversation tonight. Um, because while these governments like the Russian government, like the Chinese government may have sophisticated malware to get on your endpoints, thankfully to the best of our knowledge, they've not broken encryption. As far as we know, encryption still does work um, when it is truly protected end to end and you haven't given them the ability to sit in the middle of it because you've trusted a certificate or something like that. And we'll go through that as as we go through. But it's um as we sit on the precipice of potentially, you know, real active war um going on and and potentially one sovereign state overthrowing another, or who knows what that looks like. It's good to ask questions if you have operations in Ukraine, how would they be impacted? And as companies all over the world continue to wrestle with um, how to best approach China, because it is this very, very, very large market with a tremendous amount of opportunity, and the capitalists among us say they're not doing their jobs if they're not selling to the audience that wants to buy it's our job as information security professionals to advise them on the risks associated with that. Um, obviously, doing business with China comes with a price. And uh, organizations that, that make that choice need to acknowledge those risks that come with that. And, and so this is, just, this is all just good conversation to have, and it brings it all to light, whether it's the Russia-Ukraine situation, whether it's, again, having the Olympics in China, which have been of such a different tone Andy, then you think of back in 2008 when China hosted the summer games in Beijing. Uh, it, it's been so different this time because there's been so much more conversation around surveillance, around human rights, around the human right to privacy, around China's zero tolerance COVID strategy and how that compares to the Western world. And I think Thankfully, we're having those conversations because a lot of the times the Olympics are an, an opportunity for these countries. And especially lately, uh, a lot of authoritarian regimes have been hosting the Olympics to attempt to paper over a lot of the challenges with their countries. And you even think back to the coverage of those 2008 Olympics. It was so different in tone uh, as, a, as compared to today. I think the Sochi Games in 2014 in Russia um, definitely attracted more attention, but still not to the level of today. And I think that's a great thing. I think that shows a growing awareness of the information technology and information security concerns that these authoritarian governments raise and the impacts on all of us in a global interconnected world. And uh, it's just really good to have these conversations and to think through them. And for our, our listeners, the InfoSec professionals of the world, how it impacts your business. So how you can go back and advise to your business leaders on the impacts they need to be concerned about and um, what actions they need to take as a result of that. And they could be dramatic uh, if a um, if some of the worst concerns come to pass, which, you know, as we sit here on the precipice for, as we record Friday night, um, February 18, we hope that a lot of the, uh, concerns and warnings don't come to pass, but it's better to be prepared than not. I remember thinking as we were talking to that customer, sometimes it's easy when you're not the concerned person to think like, oh, they're making a big deal out of nothing. Because as information security professionals, a lot of times we're alarmist. You know, we're like thinking worst case scenario, like what if this and what if this? And so, yeah, there are edge cases in the worst case scenarios. And we hope that that doesn't come to pass, but it's always good to think about it at least and talk through them. 
I think this whole thing with Russia and Ukraine, and especially with the cyber attacks that happened already, right? Like we, we are on the precipice of a physical war, but the cyber war actually already happened. Like they've already launched attacks. And I think for any company that does business with, you know, in that region, you need to start thinking about how that will impact your business if, you know, Russia does invade and take over. China's also a really interesting discussion. There's a lot about the Chinese government in Taiwan. Right now, Taiwan is technically Republic of China. It's not independent, so to speak. It's not recognized as a sovereign country. There's a lot of tiptoeing around that whole subject. But let's understand, as far as a global economy goes, Taiwan, it has a democratic government right now. And it own, it produces 92% of the world's advanced semiconductors. The semiconductors that have been a bit short during the pandemic for all of our cars, all of our computers, pretty much anything these days uses a CPU. Like your refrigerator probably has a CPU in it, you know? So all that stuff is produced by China and th- or I'm sorry, produced by Taiwan and think about if China were to actually take over the government in Taiwan and the implications of the global supply chain that they would then own 92% of the world's production on semiconductors. It's such a big concern for national security and information security that the Biden government actually proposed to set aside $50 billion of the $2 trillion infrastructure bill specifically for the semiconductor industry with an emphasis on expanding U.S. manufacturing of the chip. So actually having manufacturing of semiconductors within the U.S. So these are all concerns that I think about as an information security defender. When you do have businesses, offices within these autocratic countries or countries with unstable governments the first thing you want to think about obviously is securing business data how do you do that like adam mentioned the telco companies or the isps getting taken over by a hostile government like how do you protect your data that's flowing through those networks when an autocratic government has taken over the traffic When we were talking to the customer that had these concerns, we were talking through VPN. VPN is a way to protect network traffic. In China, it's actually illegal for a Chinese citizen to have a VPN. For some businesses, they do allow that. And it's not blocked on the Chinese uh, internet, especially if you're using like a protocol like OpenVPN because that traverses over port 443 and you can't just like block Port 443. But there are different protocols for VPN. So just talking through the the protocols for VPN, because if you do think about this and you're like, oh, VPN is the way that I want to protect my corporate data, you want to implement your VPN tunnel using a safe protocol like OpenVPN or like IKE V2 with IPSEC, right? Like you don't want to use the older protocols like a point to point tunneling protocol or a layer two tunneling protocol, those have been known to be cracked. And so if you think about VPNs, there's actually stuff that's like double encapsulated because you have the VPN tunnel, which is secured from end to end, and then you can encapsulate the data as well. So open VPN utilizes the SSL open SSL libraries. They, um, have a RSA 4096 handshake, and then they use SHA-512 for hash authentication. So the highest level of encryption possible. So that's kind of the gold standard. And if you're doing anything less for these type of situations, I would question whether or not VPN is the right security tool. 
there was also some discussion on maybe the government may force you to put a certificate on your devices, right? That actually happened in 2015. I think it was a big um, hoopla in the information security world. Like Kazakhstan actually forced all of its citizens to do that. That's a pretty rare thing for governments to do these days. Uh, most governments, like Adam said, don't have the means to crack the encryption. So in order to spy on their citizens, they would actually have to resort to something like that where they man in the middle of the traffic. But it's pretty rare that governments are forcing citizens to install a certificate on their devices. Not to say that it doesn't happen, but if you do tunnel your traffic through a proper VPN tunnel, and then you force that to be always on, you have it maybe be a device level VPN so that the user doesn't have to enable it, then I think for the most part, you've mitigated a lot of the risk Maybe not all of it, but certainly a good chunk of the risk that can be avoided from a government trying to spy using the ISP or the telco companies. One of the things we talked about on that note, too, with the certificate idea is that, and you'll have to consult your specific operating system you're looking at in the MDM, so specifications for that operating system. But as we were having that conversation, we were able to look and see that on iOS, as an example, it is a MDM configurable option to block untrusted certificates and, and essentially not allow the user to trust a certificate. Um, at that point, you know, the, the government could try to get users to install the cert and they just wouldn't be able to. So it would at least protect your organization in that sense. Um, and also, of course, your end user, right? So that's an example. There's probably on other platforms as well. We are just kind of brainstorming and just seeing where that was possible. And, and we did note that is an option on iOS. I'd be willing to bet on other platforms as well. That seems like a common thing to do is don't allow users to create additional certificate trusts. Don't allow them to set that, that trust setting um, would make a lot of sense. And uh, you know, good call out in the VPN. I, I think again, w- as far as we're aware and as far as the intelligence that's being shared publicly with the guidance, there has not been reporting that governments are able to break encryption that as far as we know uh, still stands up. However, that doesn't mean they're not trying to get that information pre-encryption because that is still a, a, a method that, involves risk. And we've talked about on this show in the past with uh, who were those Israeli folks, the NSO group, Andy, that had created the malware for iOS. And uh, I would be very willing to bet that um, the fine folks in, in Russia and China have potentially created similar uh, zero day malware for mobile devices or, or desktop class operating systems that could similarly view data pre-encryption and, and exfiltrate it in that way. And that doesn't require them to break encryption. It just requires them to have a known vulnerability and vulnerability in the respective operating systems that's yet to be patched. Even in end-to-end encrypted communication, we talked about it in the past with Apple's CSAM, where they were detecting files that were being sent using iMessage and Apple was detecting the, you know, whatever the prohibited content pre-encryption to compare it with the libraries to see if that was, you know, child pornography or something like that. But that was also pre-encryption. So even with end to end, it can be captured if you have a presence on the device. But you can use end-to-end encrypted communication. Teams, for example, does have end-to-end encrypted. Um, Stuff like Zoom has end-to-end encrypted. So that can also mitigate some as long as there's not a presence or malware or something like that. The device isn't compromised at that level. I also think uh, maybe proxying your traffic through something like Zscaler might also work. You can't necessarily integrate that with a vpn sometimes just because of if you're doing a full vpn tunnel and then you're also doing a proxy that can get very very dicey 
But if you don't have time to do a VPN or spin up something like that, because you have to have a termination point close by, uh, you could use some something like Zscaler, right? Where it does only do your traffic for port 80 and 443. So if you have other traffic like file shares or whatnot, that's not going to be protected. But at least your traffic is getting proxied for port 80 and 443. And you can tunnel it out of the country that way. So there are other options there. Um, I mean, I, I told you, Adam, before the show, if I was a cybersecurity defender at a company right now and my company was using uh, services or had business within these autocratic countries as a advisement of risk, as a cyber risk, I would try to push you know, my leadership to move those businesses out of these countries. Yeah, it, it, it's um, it's to that point, right? And, and uh, again, China China presents this very challenging case for uh, capitalists everywhere. I, I think you look at a company like Apple that has has really shown itself to have a, a very sterling record on a lot of cases of of human dignity of human rights as far as. I genuinely believe in Apple's pursuit of, of privacy as a human right, as an example. And, and certainly Apple has done very good things to advance the rights of the LGBTQ community as well. And at the same time, that siren song of China and that massive market and that massive manufacturing expertise and manufacturing ecosystem has been impossible for them to resist. So you have this, paradox almost where this company that again has done tremendously good things for human rights rights like privacy um also is is very tied to uh, a, a country that has a, a challenging record on some of those things you know and um that's that's the challenge there i think ukraine potentially is a simpler case because it represents less upside um and and at this point far more risk and um Again, you you make the advisement, and then the business folks will do what they do. Um, but I think it's critically important they understand how challenging this has become, because Andy, you and I work with again a lot of customers, a lot of multinational organizations, and sometimes it feels like IT is carrying the burden of the decisions made by the business to to operate in certain countries, and the business is not being respectful for the tremendous challenges they are they are burdening their IT folks with. And the IT folks are always very good about being solutions oriented oriented and trying to do the right thing for the company and trying to find a solution. And they do some very hacky things sometimes to try to get to a good place to support the business that says, darn it, we're going to do business in China or Ukraine or, or Russia or wherever. And you figure out a way to make it work. And I think to, I don't know if we have a lot of business leaders listening to our podcast, but if you are one of them, I think also gaining more empathy and understanding for how hard it is for IT folks to meet your company objectives for security and performance and everything else in these countries is incredibly difficult. It's just really, really challenging. And I take my hat off to some of the folks at these multinational organizations because they are dealing with some really challenging stuff and it is hard and it's hard for everyone or anyone to have all the right answers here. You know, Hey, one, one other like technical thing, Andy, we talked about too, was this idea of having some sort of digital twin or some sort of, you know, hot, hot backup or something like that where you continue to have data storage and data operations in one of these countries, but you can very quickly fail over out of the country and potentially even, you know, do a mass deletion of what's left there if it were to be taken over in a kinetic war um, or, or something to that effect. And so that was another interesting conversation was having some sort of like hot swappable, you know, backup, cloud offering so that if 
if you do have IT organization, IT operations in a country that's potentially uh, could could face a foreign government taking it over, um, that you can make those changes really quickly. And so that was another interesting discussion too. I kind of came in at the tail end of that, but another interesting thing to think about. Yeah, because you and I were thinking endpoints and mobile devices. Right. But yeah, if you have servers and data mm -hmm. actually physically hosted there, then that's a huge concern, right? Because and that was that was the conversation of having duplication somewhere else that you can swap to. Right. I remember at my old company where we did have operations in China, anytime a user traveled to that country when we did travel, right? Uh, they would have to bring a, th a throwaway computer as well. You know, throwaway computer, a, a disposable uh, phone. Um, we advised that you know, no personal data. Don't sign into uh, your personal email or your personal Apple account or whatever. So those are things, you know, that you would want to think about if you had operations in those countries and you're actually sending people there which probably isn't happening right now because of the pandemic, mm -hmm. but eventually that'll open up and those are all their concerns. So I think this was a really good conversation. I, I thought it was interesting that a customer brought this to our attention and, and wanted to talk through it. And so I wanted to talk through it with you, Adam on the show, just to hash out for our listeners, because I think there's a lot going on in the world and that sometimes it's just noise because there's so much that cyber defenders are worried about. Mm -hmm. But it is something that we should keep in the back of our minds, it's especially if your business has offices, employees in these types of hot zones. Mm -hmm. One final parting thought here on something you talked about earlier is just kind of a uh, other thing to interest yourself with our listeners as you uh, go about your week. Andy made mention Taiwan and its relationship with the people's Republic of China versus Taiwan calls itself the Republic of China. And Taiwan of course is a, a democratic country and China is not the people's Republic of China is not. Um, if you want to burn a couple of hours, the the Wikipedia article about these things is really fascinating and interesting. And, and I learned a lot from, from trying to understand this too, because I was confused by the fact that sometimes it's Taiwan, sometimes it's Taipei, sometimes it's Chinese Taipei, you know, sometimes it's the Republic of China, like why all these different names? And Andy talked about some of the appeasement of the People's Republic of China doesn't recognize this as a sovereign state. And they have used some of their muscle to force other countries to not give recognition to Taiwan, to the Republic of China. And so you get into these really odd scenarios. Like I remember the World Baseball Classic, which is a uh, international tournament of different national baseball teams, refers to them as Chinese Taipei, which is also the name they use uh, when they compete in the Olympic games as well. And they have this kind of flag that's, that's white with the Olympic rings on it uh, with kind of a cloud around it. And, and all of these stories on, on how all this came to be, it's very fascinating reading. And it's, and it's a good thing to understand as, as Andy talked about with Taiwan owning so much of the semiconductor manufacturing and, and to understand the risks that could be inherent with that and why we need more global diversity of semiconductor manufacturing would be a, a very, very good thing. So just, just as a kind of closing thought here on something I found very interesting and our listeners might find interesting as well is understanding that dynamic more deeply and gaining a better understanding and appreciation of it because it's, it's very, very interesting to say the least. Something very close to my heart because my parents came from Taiwan. I still have family there. So hopefully I got all the I details right upon. that I said. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was good. Well, that's our show for this week. Thanks for listening and watching, as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you guys have any questions or follow-up topics you want us to talk about. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week.
Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.